obstacle or opportunity? This is our series that we've been in for the past four weeks. We got four more weeks. This is gonna take us all the way through February. Make sure you're here for every single week of it because we just believe it's gonna be that good and that encouraging. And what we're doing, if you're new to our church, we're taking this thought, this idea that sometimes in life we're gonna go through some obstacles. Raise your hand if you've ever been through an obstacle in life. Raise your hand if you're in one right now. Yeah, life's gonna throw obstacles at us. It's gonna throw storms at us. We're gonna go through difficult things. But because of God, come on somebody, it's never just an obstacle. Because of God, there's always an opportunity for God to grow us, for God to stretch our faith, for God to teach us something. And so that's what we're gonna do today. Here's our theme verse, James chapter one. This is an eight-week series, baby. You better have this memorized because we're gonna read this for eight weeks in a row. If you're able to, can you stand for the reading of God's word? I'm gonna read it. You just follow along with me. You ready? Dear brothers and sisters, that's you. When troubles, that's what you're going through, of any kind come your way, consider it, say it with me, Anne. Opportunity. That's where we got the idea for the series title. Consider an opportunity for for great joy. For, For you know that when your faith is tested, and some of you, your faith's being tested right now, that's when your endurance has a chance to grow. So, So your endurance gets to grow when your faith gets tested. Let's read on. So let it grow. Like, let it, like, let it happen. For when your endurance is fully developed, man, that's when you're gonna be perfect and complete and you're not gonna need anything because God's gonna come along and go, I got you. I'm walking you through this. I am your God. I'm with you and I'm gonna strengthen you. Hey, come on. Yeah. Say yeah. yeah. Now sit down. So today, I had this message that I've been preparing for a couple weeks. I was gonna preach on the topic of joy. Talk about when you're going through obstacles, it's an opportunity for joy like this verse said. But as I was preparing this message, I just felt like, man, I don't know if I'm supposed to preach that this Sunday. And as I was flying back into Jacksonville, I started writing down some other thoughts, and I kept trying to write this message on joy this week, and it just wasn't coming. And on Thursday morning, I woke up, and the Lord just dropped something in my heart. And I just started writing down things as fast as I could. Now, I have a whiteboard. If I walked you in, my wife and I, we share an office. If I walked you into my office, you would see a whiteboard of how I plan out what we're gonna teach on. So I know what I'm teaching on next Sunday and the following Sunday, and it's all subject to change if the Lord wants me to. I even know what series we're going into March and April and June, because I'm praying through this stuff. And, and, And so I'm planned out for like a couple months out. But then, every once in a while, God will just put something on my heart and I'll realize in that moment, Maybe I'm supposed to preach something different. And so if you need to hear a message on joy through the obstacles, through the pains of life, make sure you come back for this series. It's probably gonna be next week. I don't know. It might be something else. I don't know when. But today I wanna preach on something else that I felt like the Lord just put in my heart. And on Thursday morning I woke up and God just dropped something in my heart and I just started writing down every thought that came to my mind. And I wrote this message in 10 minutes which is not always the case. Sometimes it's a grind, but I just wrote down thought after thought, verse after verse, illustration that just kept coming to my mind, and I just sat there and I said, God, is this for me, or is this for our people? And he said, it's both. And so I just wanna preach to you today's obstacle and opportunity. I wanna talk about guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. And I wanna break down why I'm preaching this and who it's for, and I think it's for everybody, but there are somebody, some people specifically that it's for. My entire Christian life has been one where I have battled guilt and shame. I gave my life to Jesus at 17, and I battled the guilt and shame of some past mistakes that I made before I started following Jesus. Then, as I started following Jesus, I battled guilt and shame of mistakes I made along the way of following Jesus and thinking, I'm a failure, I'm never gonna be able to get this right. And then I also battle guilt and shame of, man, I'm just not a good Christian. I don't read my Bible enough. I don't pray enough. Even as the pastor of Rise Church, I have battled guilt and shame of, I'm just not a great pastor. I don't have what it takes. And I understand all of that are lies from the enemy. I know that. I'm very aware of that. Please don't come up to me afterwards and go, you're amazing. We love you so much. I know that. (laughs) Okay? Now, if you want to say that to me, thank you. I appreciate it. I'm not saying don't encourage me. Thank you for that. I know their lies. It still doesn't change the fact that I battle them on a daily basis. 
And I would venture to say that some of you in here today, you, you battle this as well. That you just feel the guilt and the shame of, of your past. But specifically, I felt like the Lord put on my heart, like a lot of you are battling the guilt and shame of actually your present. Something that is, is present in your life. Something like a mistake you've made recently. And maybe somebody found out about it and, and, and you're wearing the guilt and shame of how that affected them or maybe nobody knows. And you're wearing the guilt and shame because if anybody found out, what would they think about you? And the enemy will throw this on you and it will paralyze you and it'll keep you. It, it, is, it is one of the number one obstacles I believe the enemy will throw at you. And we see it from the very beginning. In the beginning, in Genesis, God creates Adam and Eve, right? He says to them, don't eat of that tree. They go, cool, enjoy the garden, this is great, but then they do what? They eat of the tree. They eat the fruit that God tells them not to eat of, and as soon as they do, they realized, oh my gosh, we blew it, we made a mistake, we've sinned against God, and the first thing they do is they run and they hide. And the enemy will use guilt and shame to bring separation from God. So, before they ate of the fruit, Adam and Eve used to just walk in the garden with God. Pretty cool, right? They would talk to God on a daily basis. They had a relationship with God. But when they sin and rebel against God, they run and they hide from him. God comes walking through the garden going, hey, where are you guys? Did God know where they were? Yes. Did he know what they had done? Yes. But he's calling out to them, we're hiding from God, God's trying to get our attention. Some of you are at church today and I'm so glad you're here, but you are hiding from God. And you can't. Why would you try? Well, you think God's mad at you. You think God's disappointed in you. You have so much guilt and shame over what you've done in your life that you're trying to hide from God and that's what the enemy wants to do. He wants to separate you from God. So, before you're a follower of Jesus, and if you're in this place and you're not a follower of Jesus, you have never surrendered your heart to him, we are so glad you're in our church. If you're watching online, you've never given your life to Jesus, we're so glad that you're here. The enemy's got you right where he wants you, though. Separated from God. But Jesus... And if you call upon Jesus to come into your life, to be your savior, to be your Lord, that you ask him to forgive you of your sins, wash you clean, make you new, Jesus will come in, he will do all of that, and he will restore your relationship to God. It's beautiful. But then the enemy will look on and go, all right, well, I had you separated, but now you're one with God, so now I'm gonna put guilt and shame on you to make you feel separated from God, to make you feel like you have to hide from God that God doesn't wanna be around you. And the enemy is relentless at this. The name Satan means accuser, accuser. And he will make accusations against you to God, calling you out on all your junk. Raise your hand if you've ever been um, addicted slash watched slash got caught up in an episode of Law and Order. Come on, somebody. Go ahead, hit it. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. I don't know what it is. My wife, if we're not watching a medical drama, we're watching something about law, like a legal drama. Like that, that girl is addicted to medical and legal dramas. That's all she wants to watch. And we didn't have cable for the first few years of our marriage, and so you, you could, with the antenna and the, and the bunny ears and everything, you could get some Law & Order episodes, and, and so we would watch those all the time. And I'm, I'm not a legal expert by, by any means. Um, I actually call my fist Law & Order right here, so if you ever want some of that, let's go. But what I know about legal stuff is that um, if you've ever been, um, ra raise your hand if you've ever been accused of something. Have you ever been accused of something? Raise your hand if you've ever been accused of something that you didn't do. Yeah, yeah, that's called living, okay? <laughs> and there are people in life, right? Friends, family, enemies, coworkers that will accuse you to try to throw your name in the mud. And, and, and when they do, they accuse you of something that you didn't do, you, you can try to defend yourself, right? You can tell your version of the story. Depending on who said it, sometimes you just need to ignore it. Like, just consider the source, right? And just ignore it all together. But if we think about like a legal setting, like a courtroom setting, 
we understand that if somebody is accused of a crime, they have to then go before a judge and a jury, right? And in our society, you are innocent until proven guilty, not with the devil. With the devil, the moment you do something stupid, the moment you make a mistake, the moment you sin, he is trying to throw all the guilt and all the shame on you. And so in a courtroom, if you're accused of a crime, you gotta go in and you have to state your case. You have to try to go before a judge and proclaim, I didn't do it, you are the defendant. You have to do defend yourself. And in so defending yourself, you may call forth some witnesses to help your case. And in a courtroom setting, and if you're a legal person and I get this wrong, just find me afterwards and tell me how terrible of a preacher I am. There's three different types of witnesses. There's an eyewitness, meaning this person was on the scene of the crime. They were there when it happened, they saw some stuff, they saw a person, they saw everything, how it went down, and they can tell their version of the story because, because they were there. And then there's an expert witness, somebody that's an expert in whatever field. So if it's a bank robbery, this person's like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a bank robbery specialist. I'm an expert in that field. If it's a car wreck, then they can give their version because they're an expert. They've been doing this. And then there's a character witness. And that's a somebody that's gonna come forward on your behalf and go, oh, they were a great person. They would never do anything like that. If I ever get arrested for getting into like a fight at Walmart, okay? I might call upon some of y'all as a character witness, and you'd be like, not, not my pastor. It could happen, it really could. If you ever get in a fight at Walmart, don't ask me to be your character witness, because I'm like, I don't know, they're a little rough around the edges. And so we got these witnesses that will come forward and they'll testify for the defendant what they've seen. Now go with me for a minute, because this is how the Lord dropped it in my heart. Are you with me? In Revelation chapter 12, the Bible tells us this, and I don't know when this takes place, but Revelation is a peek into heaven. It says that Satan, the accuser, stands before God day and night accusing you. And these are not thoughts, accusations. It's not like he's making stuff up about you. Well, they said this and they did that because God, who knows all things, would be able to look on and go, no, they didn't. The accusations he's making against you are true. And he's accusing you of every mistake you've ever made and every sin you've ever committed. He is the accuser. And in this, God's the eyewitness. Because he's accusing you. They did this, they said that, they did this, they hurt that person, they looked at this, they did all these, like yes, yes, yes. And God's going, yep, I saw the whole thing. He's the eyewitness. And in that moment, God himself is kind of actually agreeing with the devil. You're right. They did it. I know everything. I've seen their whole life. I know that what you're accusing them of is true. But then Jesus comes in as the expert witness. And he goes, well, I've got a little expertise in this whole sin thing. Because it was actually the sins of the world that I had to step out of heaven and he starts testifying and witnessing of why he came from heaven to earth as the savior of the world. He starts giving an expert witness on crucifixion. Actually, they nailed my hands here and all my blood was shed for the sins of the world. And I'm kind of an expert in this in the savior department because I'm the only one. And so Jesus testifies, yeah, there's a lot of sin in their lives, but that, that, that's why I came. I came to die for their sins. And then, and then the Holy Spirit shows up as the character witness. And the Holy Spirit says, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're messed up. Oh yeah, they are so jacked up. But there was a moment in their life where they called upon Jesus to be their savior. And in that moment, I actually then came to live in their life and I've been changing them from the inside out. They're not who they need to be yet, but they're not who they used to be. I'm working in them. Ooh. I'm writing it down and I'm like, this is so good. And the enemy's accusing you. And the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are coming as your witnesses going, 
yeah, but we, we paid that price. Yeah, I know everything they've done. You, you can't say anything about them that I don't already know, but Jesus paid that price. The Holy Spirit is changing them. They are not the same that they used to be, but the enemy wants to keep you in guilt and shame, saying, no, you're just a mess, you're a wreck. God could never do anything with your life. You're a failure. And the Holy Spirit and God the Father and Jesus are saying, no, there is more. And I don't want you to live in guilt and shame any longer. Satan accuses Jesus pleads. I love how Romans says it like this. Here's the author of Romans. Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. Meaning the devil can try to accuse us, but we ain't even gonna listen to him. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Meaning, we were enemies of God, separated from God, but because of Jesus now, we've been made right with God. We've been forgiven so that when God looks at you, he doesn't hold your sin against you any longer. He sees his son Jesus in you who paid the penalty for your sin. And then he goes on to say this, so who then will condemn us? Nobody. Nobody can. The enemy can try to condemn you, but he can't. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. And he is sitting at the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. What, what is Jesus doing right now? Is he throwing the football around? He's fishing up in heaven? Hanging out with those baby angels with their harps? No, no. He's pleading for you. The enemy's going, look at their lives. You shouldn't love them, God. And Jesus is like, no, no, no. We died. Remember, we died for that. I gave my life for them. Yeah, they're sinful, but, but I forgive them. He's pleading for you. And I hope somebody gets excited. Because of the blood of Jesus, we are declared <laughs> not guilty. Not guilty. And I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't know what my expectation was. I just thought somebody was gonna throw something in that moment. Like just get so excited. I'm assuming that somebody watching online right now just threw something across the room because you're so excited that the sentence came down and you are declared not guilty. And, 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 and for some of you, maybe you can't get excited because you, 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 can't, you can't claim that because the guilt and the shame feels so much that you're like, well, that's good for everybody else, but... but not me. You, you too. And the enemy wants to keep you in a hold going, no, no, that's not for you. Because of the blood of Jesus, we are declared not guilty. Now, I've never had to go before a judge before. I've never had to plead my case in front of a jury. But if I was, and they declared me not guilty, <laughs> I would probably have got a little more excited than you just did. Let me, tell you about, let me tell you about a woman in the Bible who I promise you got real excited about a not guilty verdict. John chapter eight. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. She is with a man that is not her husband. The law of Moses says that we are to stone her, that we are literally to pick up rocks right now throw them at her until we kill her. This woman has made a mistake. She has done something she should not have done, and now here's the consequences of it. They say to Jesus, what do you say? Like, what do you think? This is what the law of Moses says, what do you say? Let's read on. They were trying to trap him. They didn't care about this woman. This was all of trap for Jesus. The enemy doesn't care about you. He just doesn't want you close to Jesus. They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. This is classic Jesus, I love this. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. Jesus is awesome, okay? They bring this before him and he was like, what you're bringing to me is not even worthy of me responding to you. I would literally rather bend down and play in the dirt. Isn't that awesome? Some of us would do so well to adopt this, 
scrolling through social media, you read something that you don't like, it makes you mad, and you wanna fire back a response, just go outside and play in the dirt. You're watching the news, and you're watching Fox or CNN and blah, 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 and all the politics and stuff. Oh, by the way, make sure you come back one of these weeks of this. We're gonna talk about politics. It's gonna be so good. It's controversial. It's gonna be awesome. I can't wait. But some of you, like honestly, watching the news, just turn it off and go outside and play in the dirt. Like it's not even worth you responding to. Matter of fact, when you leave today, we got a sandbox for every single one of you, okay? <laughs> I wanna walk outside one day and just see dirt all over the face of adults at our church. I was gonna say something, but I just started playing in the dirt. Let's read on. They kept demanding an answer. Jesus was like, doo -doo, doo -doo. Uh, come on. So he stood up and he said, all right, let's kill her. Let's do this. But let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down he said, y'all interrupted me. <laughs> and he starts playing in the dirt again. Let's read on. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until, whew, I love that, only Jesus. Only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Hey, where are your accusers? Where, where'd they go? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. This was the moment that if Jesus wanted to heap guilt and shame on this woman, he could have done it. This was the moment that if Jesus wanted to condemn her, he could have said, I'm gonna throw the rocks at you. But he said, I don't, can, your accusers are gone? I'm not your accuser either. I'm not gonna condemn you. I'm gonna show, you deserve punishment, but I'm gonna show you grace. You deserve death, but I'm gonna show you mercy. I'm gonna show you love. Hey, lady, not guilty. Yeah. Then he says to her, but hey, get out of this lifestyle, because I got more for you. Go and sin no more. I guarantee you that woman just got the not guilty verdict. She was walking out of there going, whoa, best day ever. And for us as followers of Jesus, man, I wish from time to time that we would just get a little excited and go, man, my sin deserved to be punished and the punishment should have been eternal separation from God, hell. Because of Jesus, because he paid the penalty for my sin, the thing I deserved, I don't get. In fact, I get heaven, I get eternal life with God. Not guilty? Are you kidding me? And the enemy would love to continue to throw guilt and shame on you. Some of you, you're not gonna sign up for a small group because of guilt and shame. Because your thought is, I can't go into a group and tell them what's going on in my life because I'm gonna be judged. If I walk into a small group, they're gonna be able to look right through me and know all the crap in my life. Some of you don't serve in our church because you don't think you're worthy. What do I have to offer God? Because the guilt and the shame of the devil is so real. Some of you, can we be, can we be brutally honest in here? Some of you, let's be honest with the people that are online because they can't look at me right now. You didn't come to church today because of the guilt and shame you feel. Some of you just slept in, but others of you, like literally, you don't, you don't even wanna be here because of the guilt and shame. And then for everybody that's in the room, you couldn't even sing the songs this morning because of the guilt and shame that you feel. And you're listening to this message and you're going, oh, this is great for everybody else, but this is not for me because the devil has got you. I don't know what you did, what mistake you made, what sin you committed, but the guilt and the shame that he has thrown on you is like a heavy blanket that has got you weighed down. And I just believe with everything in me that God wants to set you free. God, God doesn't do guilt and shame. 
He does truth. He does conviction. But he does freedom. He does victory. So let me close with the story. One of my favorite people in the Bible, his name's Peter. If you've grown up in church, you know Peter's life. If you've never even grown up in church, you probably even know Peter's life. Disciple of Jesus, follower of Jesus, one of the Jesus' closest followers. Jesus looks at him one day and goes, hey, Peter, um, you're gonna deny me. And Peter's like, never. I would never do that. And then we know the story, right? Not once, not twice, but three times. Peter denies Jesus, denies that he even knows him. For three years, you've been his closest follower. Now you can't even claim him. And then we know the story. Jesus gets arrested and he dies on the cross and he's buried. Can you imagine the magnitude of the guilt and the shame that Peter wore? Because his savior, he denied that he even knew him. Spoiler alert, Jesus doesn't stay dead. He gets back up. They're obviously not impressed because they see resurrection take, all, take place all the time, Jesus, so I'm sorry for that. I'll try to pastor Rise Church a little bit better. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, Rise Church, he just died and was buried and rose again for you, so it's not that big of a deal, I guess. Golly. And Jesus finds his boy, Peter, singles him out, sits him down, and says to him, hey, Peter, do you love me? And in that moment, Peter responds back to Jesus, you know I love you. And then Jesus, weirdly, asks the same question again. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Peter's like, what? Didn't we just ask that question? Yes, you know I love you. And then Jesus asked him a third time the same question. Do you love me? And this point, the Bible tells us that Peter's offended. He's hurt. He's like, God, like Jesus, like, like, you know all things. You know that I love you. If you've been around Rise Church long enough, you've heard me preach the story that I think it's no coincidence that Jesus asked him the question three times after Peter had denied him three times. And so he knows, hey, I know that you said three times that you didn't even know me, but now I wanna hear you say three times that you love me. Not because I don't know that you love me. Peter, I need you to be reminded. I need you to remember, Peter, that you love me. Some of you in here need to be reminded, you love Jesus. You love him. I know you love him. You've just gotten distracted. You've gotten discouraged. You've gotten disappointed. You've been off track in your life. You lost sight of God, but you love him. I know you do. Would you remind yourself today that you love him? And then Jesus says each time, hey, Peter, do you love me? He's like, I love you. And then Jesus says to him, then I need you to feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. Then Peter, I need you to feed my sheep. Hey, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Then I need you to feed my sheep, meaning I need you to remember how much you love me because you've been living in guilt and shame. And it's only my love that's gonna set you free from that and allow you to go feed my sheep. Who are his sheep? His people. Peter, I need you to get your voice back. Peter, I need you to get your hope back. I need you to get your purpose back because there's other people over here who are living in the same guilt and shame that you're in and I'm gonna use you, Peter to set them free. I need you to get free first. You can't take somebody to a place you've never been. So let the Lord do it in you, come on, so that he can lead you to lead somebody else. And so this is my prayer for you this morning. This has been my prayer for you since Thursday when God gave me this message, that God would set you free today. I don't know who this is for, but I just believe that the Lord is doing it You've been walking around with guilt and shame long enough. The enemy has had a stranglehold on you. Today, God's gonna break some changes. There's gonna be a revival that takes place in your heart this morning. If you're with me, say yeah. yeah. Every head bowed, every eyes closed. Band, y'all can come up on the stage. 
I'm so glad that you made a decision to get into church. If you're watching online, let the Lord minister to you right where you are. The Spirit of God is in this place. And here's what we're gonna do. This might be a different church experience than you've ever had before. I don't care. I want you to respond today. Let God minister to your heart. Right now, with nobody moving, I'm gonna invite you, if today you would say, I need God to break guilt and shame off of my life, I'm just gonna ask you to come forward right now, kneel at this altar, and let the Lord minister to your heart. I need you to not care what the person beside you is gonna think, because it doesn't matter what they think. This is between you and God. I'm gonna ask you just to move right now, to not wait another second. People are moving out of their seats, praise God. This is your day. The enemy has had you held down for too long. Yes, you've made some mistakes. Yes, you've rebelled against God. Yes, there's some sin. Yes, there's some regret. But we don't have to stay in that. That's why Jesus died for us. And we have a prayer team at our church. They're just gonna come and lay hands on you right now and just pray over you. They don't need to know your situation. They're just gonna ask that the Lord just comes and moves like only he can. So many people already down front. For the rest of us, come on, don't miss this moment. Yes, you can stay in your seat. Yes, God can meet you there. But there is something powerful about taking that step and saying, God, my heart is open. I'm ready for you to move. And we're not gonna rush this moment. We're gonna let the presence of God just minister like only he can.